Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here with me. Thank you, Olena, and thank you, All Things Open, for giving me the opportunity to share some of the experience that I've done in the last couple of years, trying to deal with a few notable React Native apps. Now, as the title implies, this involves a certain technology referred to as continuous integration and continuous deployment or delivery. And usually, when we mention CI and CD, this relates to a lot of practices that people adopt it, for instance, whether they want to adopt the agile practice, maybe deploy certain DevOps uh, cultures, and so on and so forth, or just wants to get into the much more frequent release uh, cycles. From the way I look at it, um, at the end of the day, this is designed to answer a simple question. And something that very often happens within any kind of development system, engineers often discuss why certain things don't work with uh, their stakeholders. And it boils down to one particular situation that occurs almost on a daily or even weekly basis. Whatever is being worked on apparently doesn't work in different system or different laptops or different developer machines, but hey, it works on my machine. Now the half joking solution to this will be to just pack your machine and we send it to production and of course, this can apply to certain technology, but doesn't necessarily always apply to, in our context, React Native apps. Because if it works on my setup and I'm working on Android, it works on my Android emulator, it doesn't mean that I can, I can ship this, this code to uh, all the Android users. Now, um, this is the, pro the first problem that we want to uh, tackle. The other problem will be this uh, battle back and forth between, let's say, your development team and your testers um, exchanging APKs because for instance, certain bugs have been fixed and therefore the testers need to um, install a different set of apps and launch the app again and verify that, oh no, it wasn't fixed yet. And then the tester realized that, oh, I installed the wrong version or the wrong uh, build and so on and so forth. And this keeps becoming a problem because it's hard to track which apps is being tested uh, manually right now. And it's also hard to go back to, let's say, uh, the person that works the day before, the week before, the month before, unless an extensive history and archive um, is being uh, taken care of, which is usually not the case. Now, it's probably useful to refer back to the article written by Martin Fowler a few years ago. And it's a long statement, but what I want to highlight here at the end of the day Continuous integration is a question of practice. And the key points of this practice will be one, it has to be a frequent integration. Um, in other words, if, if some developers decided to go in a cave and then decided to come up with features and then work on it for three months and come back, get out of the cave and then try to integrate that, that doesn't necessarily confirm uh, with continuous integration or this continuous aspect of this integration. That's one thing. Uh, in order to shift this uh, logically or notionally, there has to be some ways to be able to integrate all these uh, features or bug fixes, anything that each developer um, work on in an automated fashion. And therefore it implies that tests and automated build needs to exist. So in the CI space, there's a lot of uh, solutions from do-it-yourself do it such as Jenkins to many CI as a surface from Travis, Upveyor, Circle CI, Azure Pipe, and a few others. And uh, we're not going to cover all of them. Uh, I'm just going to give an example of something that I think a bit more suitable for React Native uh, for iOS and Android development. And just to make sure that everyone understands this, a full disclaimer: I work. Uh, I don't work for any of the companies. Uh, this is not a paid endorsement. I'm just a happy customers and um, eager to share the experience uh, that I've done. All right, let's start with the CI part. And this is this should be easy. Right? Um, let's take a look at typical development process. There's a main branch or master branch uh, where, for instance, a lot of work happen. And then usually follows the typical style of creating a feature brands for small features or big features. Um, the aspect of CI mandates that at some point, this can be integrated back into the main branch. Again, ideally as frequently as possible, multiple times a day, and also automated. Nobody needs to do 
the manual merge by hand. And in order to shift this, the important aspect of this will be, well, how do we build uh, the React Native apps for Android and iOS in such a way that um, it can be built automatically. It doesn't require someone to check out on a laptop that has the Android SDK and iOS SDK and all development tools. Um, for this uh, presentation, I'm going to give an example of using GitHub Actions. This is part of GitHub Workflow. Uh, if you want to follow along, there is a sample project, github.com slash aria slash hello dash react dash native. This is the most simple React Native apps possible. It does nothing but to display Hello World. And uh, it's intended to be like that so that we can just pay attention to how the entire CI and CD for this particular project they're being developed. GitHub Actions is a feature that have been available for GitHub for a while. It's part of the GitHub for workflows. And the, the advantage of GitHub Actions is that it's uh, very well integrated into GitHub compared to other third-party CI such as Travis or AppFair or Azure Pipelines. Now, in order to come up with GitHub workflows uh, with certain actions, it's very simple. Uh, all we need to do is to create a directory called .github slash workflows. And inside this directory, we're gonna put a couple of YAML files that uh, defines the type of actions that we want to uh, that, that we want GitHub to execute as part of the workflow. Now, you could definitely compress this or com compact this or put it together in one YAML file, um, but based on my experience, it's usually very useful to split this into multiple different actions depending on what the action is doing. For instance, in these examples, I have one YAML file for Android build and the other one for iOS and a separate file just for checking the code quality. Now, once these three files are checking in, or how many uh, how, how many YAML files you want to have, are checking in, uh, into the uh, repo, every time you push to the repo or whenever there's a pull request, then this um, whatever action defined in this YAML file will be executed by GitHub. And this is also manifested in the status for every single commit. For instance, we have um, the commit history view from this Hello React Native projects. And you can see the green check marks on every commit, and that indicates that all the checks, aka the GitHub actions, have been executed and they pass with, in this case, uh, success. So there's no problems. And you can see the names of those uh, actions and root code quality in iOS corresponding to each of the YAML files. This is fantastic because whenever there's some problems, we can go back and look at the history of the commit history from the web interface of GitHub and uh, demonstrate that, oh yeah, you know, the build breaks at certain points uh, on these commits, for instance. So ideally, of course, it shouldn't happen. This is the purpose of continuous integration. So let's start with a simple YAML file. Um, this is just code quality YAML. It is a React Native project and therefore it carries a lot of uh, uh, uniqueness regarding the Node.js project. For instance, this YAML file is, is so small, but it does a lot of things that uh, a developer normally needs to do whenever they want to work on new React Native projects. So just check it out, make a of Git clone, and then install a node. We can choose the node version here, and then run npm CI, the CI counterpart of npm install. npm CI just install packages from package log, and then run npm test which should run some of your, the tests that you have. Now, uh, if we have these files every time, um, and on, uh, I forgot to mention that in the second line, there's a, a set of push and pull requests. This indicates that this action needs to be executed whenever there's a push to any kind of branch and whenever there's a pull request, which could be handy, and I'll show you in a minute. When that happens, then, um, for every single push or every single pull request, there's a report that describes all the things that you do on the NPM test. And you can put a lot of tests there. Uh, generally speaking, there's uh, two big categories of tests for a unit test and integration test. And uh, the first one is static analyzer. This is where, for instance, you run your linter or security scanners and dependency check, or even checking for uh, other code metrics such as cyclomatic complexity. 
Another category will be a dynamic analysis or dynamic analyzer, which needs to run your code. So static analysis, just look at the code and then infer some metrics. In the case of dynamic analysis, the test itself needs to run the code. And this is manifested, for instance, in the unit tests. And with unit tests, sometimes we also try to, try to track the coverage as illustrated in these examples. Of course, I only have one test here, but uh, that test demonstrate that it gives the nice coverage on the statement and function and lines and just half of the coverage of the branch. It may or may not be what you wanted. Uh, feel free to adjust it accordingly. The point here is that any kind of test that you, you specify in the uh, YAML file will be displayed for every single commit and every single pull request. Now, um, let's take a look at the Android YAML. This is intended to run debug build as if a developer will have uh, check out the source code and run the debug. The nice thing about GitHub Actions is because it runs in the so-called virtual environments. And this virtual environments is not a generic, let's say a Docker container where you can craft or compose a number of different surfaces and, and, and tie them together. It is really intended, as the name implies, of course, to run actions that is typically uh, used to build application. And, and there's many different uh, ready to use uh, SDK, for instance, you don't need to install anything if you want to build something for, let's say, Android. The same thing, we just need to check out, pick the suitable node version, run NPM CI as usual, and then execute Gradle assemble debug. This will continue to build the debug version of our apps. Now, um, again, as I mentioned, all the build lock is going to be visible uh, straight from uh, GitHub interface. And as you can see here, the process of stuff is very fast, obviously, because this is a Hello World apps. Uh, but just to demonstrate that even with the standard, there's nothing, no component, no logic whatsoever, the build can be completed in less than two minutes. And I think that's uh, quite remarkable. It means that uh, it's, it's a fast iteration. If, if, if something goes wrong, somebody forgot the dependencies or the build doesn't compile, then obviously you're going to know about that. Uh, very quickly without waiting for minutes and minutes. Um, you can even see the entire uh, lock uh, of the entire build, including every single step of the way, uh, every invocation of Gradle, every task uh, that can be detailed, which is useful when something goes wrong. Now for iOS, very similar. Um, Again, one of the beauty of virtual environment from GitHub Actions is that you can choose on which operating system this is going to run. Um, in the previous example for Android, it is sufficient to run this on Ubuntu because Android SDK is basically available for all operating system. And the easiest one would be just to run it on Linux. But for and for iOS, as we all know, it can only build, uh, it can only run on macOS. And therefore, there's the line that specifies runs on macOS letters. Just check out uh, the code pick a Node.js apps, run npm CI. And then the next step is actually, if you use Cocoa Pods, you have to run pod install so that all the dependency will be fetched. And then we execute Xcode uh, command line as usual. We need to specify the workspace, the scheme, SDK. All of these things are not uh, strange for anyone who has built uh, iOS project for React Native. And if this is confusing, you just take a look at the Xcode terminal output, and then you just uh, copy that and adjust that accordingly to this particular uh, YAML file. Now, again, the build itself is going to take a bit longer. Uh, for instance, if you go to the build iOS debug lines here, it's going to take three minutes, 47 seconds, uh, give or take. So probably four minutes, um, I think. It's just the nature of iOS build uh, to take a bit much longer than Android. Uh, but I think it's very well manageable because, uh, yeah, four minutes. And the beauty, again, of the GitHub action is that all these things happens in parallel. So the iOS build doesn't need to wait for the Android build to complete before it started. Uh, there's a couple of tricks that is um, already in the repo, sample repo that I mentioned. But obviously, we don't have uh, time to uh, go into deeper detail here. And namely, that is the uh, caching of dependencies, because we have to package management here that we use uh, NPM and pods. Um, there's a few lines of code that you can just copy and paste. And that allows you to uh, save um, the NPM packages that gets downloaded every single build. 
In other words, uh, the first build might need to run the whole things, but the subsequent build would just copies everything from the .npm directory. Uh, for instance, in this uh, screen, you can see that npm ci just take only 21 seconds, which is impossible if it's uh, start from scratch. So it does work uh, like this, a bit of uh, speed, uh, gaining a bit of speed because of the uh, warm cache that is available in this particular one. And the same thing with pods. You can see that install pods dependency just takes, just takes 10 seconds because effectively it's just copying all the uh, downloaded Cocoa pods. Now, um, as I mentioned, one of the beauty of having this integrated into the checking process for the pull request is precisely because if someone makes a pull request to your project and that's gonna fail the check, that will be glaringly obvious in the pull request page. In this case, I simulated a commit that breaks uh, the uh, code formatting or code style that is mandated by the project and therefore it's gonna fail the code quality one. The same thing can happen. For instance, maybe someone is work working diligently on an Android uh, version of the apps, but accidentally committing something uh, or forgetting to put the dependency, the suitable corresponding dependency for iOS, iOS and therefore it's not updated. And therefore, whenever that person commits the change and then create the pull request, uh, the iOS build is broken and that will be indicated by this uh, particular broken build. That's useful because usually you work either on Android and iOS and sometimes, yeah, you're supposed to check both, but just in case you're pressed uh, uh, for time, sometimes you want to quickly continue to work on Android, not realizing that by doing that, you break the iOS build. And this is one way to do that. Obviously the other way as well. So if you're focusing on iOS build, this is a nice mechanism to keep you in check to make sure that you're not accidentally break the Android build uh, because you didn't run it uh, continuously on your machine or, or development setup. Now, one of the nice thing about all this aspect is you can store artifacts and artifacts is essentially whatever the outcome of the build process or the action here. In this example, I demonstrate the storage of the Android uh, APK, the debug uh, build. And for every single build, you get the link to the download, downloadable artifact for that debug APK that is built in the process. And, uh, the same thing applies to iOS. In this case, we, we're gonna use X archive. Um, and this is useful because for instance, um, if you don't keep the artifacts in your machine and somebody tell you, hey, can you go back to this revision and then debug that? Now you don't need to go to that re revision and then run the, run the build again. You can just uh, fetch the artifact here. This is conveniently the debug version, therefore you just need to run it on your emulator or simulator per the user stage. So in summary, uh, the pull request mechanism allows you to catch a uh, broken build. And then because GitHub Action is a first party CI, it's very well integrated. I recommend you to play with uh, GitHub Action based on the repo that I uh, just mentioned. And artifacts, it's extremely powerful. Now onto the continuous uh, de deployment or continuous delivery, if you want to uh, directly deliver the application to the end user through the App Store or Play Store. This is intended to uh, do the same thing that, that we've done for CI, but at the end of the development cycles, maybe at the end of the sprint, to really deliver the apps to your stakeholder, be it your end user, if you want to publish it to stores, or for instance, through uh, your QA or tester testing team. And again, because we are human, we make mistakes. This happens all the time that we forgot to increment the number when we're ready to uh, up upload the new uh, apps to the app store or stores. And this creates a problem. Um, alluding to the situation that I mentioned earlier, uh, when a tester managed to get an incorrect version of the apps because the build number wasn't incremented properly and that can cause us confusion. For this purpose, we're gonna use App Center. Uh, I don't work for App Center, this is not endorsement. And, and the way it works is very simple. Documentation is very cool, but I'll give you a quick walkthrough. Um, all you need to do is to go to App Center and, and, and sign in with GitHub. And then um, you should create a new app. Unfortunately, the way App Center works, the concept of new apps here is per platform. So if you work on Android and iOS, you should create an app for an app for iOS and then duplicate it again for uh, Android. In this screenshot is for Android and then you choose the React Native as a platform. Now, the beauty of um, GitHub 
uh, app center is that it does have an understanding of whether this is Java app is it a React Native app or Swift app and so on and so forth. After that, you need to connect it to the GitHub project, um, the source code of your apps. App Center also supports other sources such as Azure DevOps and Bitbucket and GitLab. Once you do that, you have to configure the build process. And this is different than the CI process because this is, this is uh, for building for production. Uh, we want to deploy it to the phones or only for testing. For instance, um, there's a sign builds uh, sections that is of course different for Android and iOS. For Android, you need to specify the key stores. You can just upload it and specify the password and so on and so forth. For iOS, again, you need to upload the uh, provisioning profile and the certificates. Um, this is fantastic because then we don't need to uh, try to account for this in our standard build process. Everything is going to be taken care of by App Center automatically. Now, once you do that, uh, we need to create the distribution group. Um, distribution group is a terms in App Center to specify a list of people identified by the emails that will get notifications whenever there's a new build uh, that is being produced by App Center. And a new build could be from a certain branch or whenever you want to push it for every single commit. So it depends on the, um, I think the uh, approach that you want to take. If it is testing during the uh, sprint, for instance, you might want to generate new apps, new build for every single commit, but there's also a different approach where you want to wait until the integration stage. And then from that, from that moment onwards, you need to create uh, the build. So App Center allows those kind of a combination, just play with uh, the settings. Now, if this is uh, implemented and you invite those uh, members of your teams to the testers, then they're going to receive an email. Uh, they'll receive an email that looks like this, invitation to test Hello React Native for Android. And then, the, and this is the uh, fascinating thing about uh, App Center because just by clicking the app, they'll go to the App Center page and then they can install it right away. It should be straightforward for uh, Android, um, a bit more complicated for iOS, but as long as whoever on the receiving end of this email just follow the instruction that is given by App Center in the email, they should be able to install the apps. As a bonus for Android, usually um, uh, installing Hockey app uh, is a companion app. You don't need to use it, but it's very useful. It's, it's, it's fantastic because then instead of going to the uh, App Center website, you can just use this Hockey app to keep track of the history of previous releases. And then that allows you also to switch between different uh, builds. So you can uninstall, let's say build number four and go back to build number one and see whether maybe is the defect have been fixed already and so on and so forth. In other words, you don't need to manually keep track of all the files and then uninstall, uninstall it uh, manually. Um, the nice thing again is that there's a release notes that maybe uh, your developer will um, uh, inform the, uh, the, the distribution groups as to what is being included in this release. App Center can also pull this release notes straight from your commit uh, history. All right, that's a little bit of a journey to a shared experience of doing CI and CD for React Native apps. And basically for CI, um, GitHub Actions is being used and for CD, App Center is the chosen solutions. Hopefully this is gonna be useful for at least five benefits. One is to reduce the unforced error. Let's say someone accidentally commits something that causes Android, iOS, iOS, or both built to fail. And that can be uh, quickly identified and prevented from making it into the uh, main branch. Also, since all the builds uh, will be executed in a pristine environment, we know that there's no drift, we know that there's no history because we will never know for each developer, for instance, what is being uh, installed and uninstalled and, and, and age with time in their respective development environment. So see if something works, in the um, App Center environment, then most likely it's gonna, it's gonna work everywhere else because it's simulating as if you have a developer that has a fresh laptop, installs the SDK and builds it for the first time. 
And also it's just an authoritative reference. So if something doesn't work on somebody's laptop or somebody's development machine, but it works on uh, maybe GitHub Action or App Center, then certainly uh, something is wrong with the development environment because again, could be multiple different factors, incorrect SDK, outdated and so on and so forth. This is also useful because whenever there's a new hire, for instance, and they have difficulty setting up their environment, they can uh, take a look at the build log from let's say GitHub Action to make sure that, oh yeah, this is what I missed. Maybe pop install wasn't executed properly and so on. That's uh, very powerful. Also a lot of tests can be implemented, um, something that is not feasible to be executed every time a developer wants to commit something can be always implemented as part of the extensive tests uh, inside GitHub Actions because GitHub Action will execute in parallel. Uh, whenever someone make a pull request, they can go on and work on some of the features without being blocked uh, by that particular uh, build status of that pull request. And last but not least, uh, we keep the archive and we keep the history and um, this is very, again very useful to let's say bisect some problems and if someone discover a bug and then we all have to find out when did happen when did it, when did it happen for the first time how was this version how is that built um, that can be achieved easily by downloading uh, the past artifact as opposed to going back one revision at a time and try to uh, com complete the uh, build again which sometimes might, might not might not work right because Three months ago, it was in certain version of React Native and now we are upgraded. So now all the development setup is kind of messed up. Yeah, um, that's uh, hopefully this is useful for all of you. And if you have some questions, uh, you can ask this on the uh, Q&A right now. Or if you need to reach out to me at later stage, feel free to contact me on Twitter.